Howdy, everybody, as you're joining, go ahead and glad you're here. Uh, we'll wait a minute or two just to let everybody get out of the waiting room and get their audio set up and all that fun stuff. So sit tight for a couple minutes. All right. Uh, thanks for everybody showing up. I guess I'll go ahead and get it start. Get started. Um, welcome to the 2022 iteration of Botany Beginners Managing Prairie Strips. Uh, up top, I want to say if you are taking this course, if you're a certified crop consultant taking this course and looking to get CEU credits, uh, go ahead and email me at andy.olson at uni.edu uh, for the sign-in sheet. We'll get that taken care of. Um, the rest of the day. Um, as always, if you have any questions uh, over the lecture, um, feel free to use the chat function. Um, next slide. Your instructor for this course is Dr. Justin Meissen, uh, the Center's Research and Restoration Program Manager, who will be leading today's lecture. Um, Dr. Laura Jackson, the Center's uh, Director, will be a guest lecturer, and she'll be on next week. Um, the assistants for the course are me, Andy Olson, the Prairie on Farms Program Manager, um, and Ann Phillips, the Community Engagement Coordinator. Uh, feel free to send uh, me an email with any questions you have, registration issues, and whatnot. Um, so I, this course will consist of approximately five hour-long webinars via Zoom, um, Tuesdays at noon, right now. Uh, the recording of the lectures will be uploaded to our YouTube page the evening of each class. My goal is at least by seven, so um, be aware of that. We'll be also be hosting an in-person field day, uh, July 22nd. Um, I'll send more details on that event in the coming weeks. Um, and finally, we'll have informal homework activities to reinforce what you are trying to learn. Um, by far, the best way to learn botany is to get out and do it. So um, highly encourage that, and it's also really nice. Um, and maybe do it in the morning before it's 100 degrees outside, like today. Um, and I would like to acknowledge Iowa State University Strips team, as well as the Via Echo Foundation for funding for this course. Um, required resources for this course include Newcomb's Wildfire Guide. Um, you can find a link on our website to the publisher's page or buy it. Um, local bookstore, order it, Amazon, that sort of thing a field weed ID guide, a site to practice plant ID at, um, of course, a proper PPE, such as sunblock, sunscreen, uh, tick protection or tick checks. Um, we also recommend a pocket, ma uh, pocket magnifying glass, uh, magnifying lens. Uh, you'll look extra cool out there as well as makes it a lot easier for certain things. Our learning goals are observe, photograph, and name important characteristics for plant ID, recognize the most common planted species in prairie strips. Uh, Justin and Laura have come up with a really, really nice list of common plants, so that'll be super helpful. Uh, gain familiarity with plant ID guides, online resources, and other tools that'll be helpful. ID plants even when they're not flowering, um, which is difficult but possible in a lot of situations. Evaluate, evaluate a prey stand, I identify management issues and suggest solutions. Um, as well as narrowing down the range of possible grasses to make plausible IDs out in the field. Um, and so today, Justin will be covering plant ID fundamentals. Um, and next week, Dr. Jackson will also be looking at the fundamentals, but with a focus on that plant ID book. So if you don't have the ID book yet, don't worry, you can get it in time for that. Um, our third lecture will focus on plants and early plantings of strips, um, as well as weed ID that week. 
Uh, week four, we'll look at mature plantings, invasive species, as well as grass ID. Um, in our last webinar, we'll discuss site assessment and seedling ID, uh, which is super exciting. It's something I am excited to learn more about uh, specifically. As I said earlier, feel free to send me any feedback about the course over the coming weeks. Uh, we're happy to add any pertinent topics that would help you all out your botany skills. Um, I touched on the field day earlier, um, more details coming soon. All right, uh, I'm done with the boring bits. Um, I wanna hand it over to Justin. Okay, thank you, Andy. Um, so I'm Justin Meissen. I'm the Research and Restoration Program Manager uh, at the Tallgrass Prairie Center here at the uh, University of Northern Iowa. And uh, yeah, I wanna welcome everyone to our course on managing uh, prairie strips and talking about uh, plant ID uh, in that uh, scenario. So, you know, just at the top of, top here, just wanna talk a little bit about why, you know, why, why is plant ID so important? You know, we're talking about managing prairie strips. So you know, what, what's the big deal about knowing all the plants? Well, the, the big deal is that you have to know what you're dealing with before you do anything with it. So, so we need to know basically what, what our stand looks like and um, what kind of things are going to respond to different kinds of management. And the only way that we can do that is by knowing what the plants are. And so that is what we're gonna be focused on is, is how, do we, how do we learn how to identify of course, we will go through how to identify specific plants, but um, also we want to build the tools and the skill set for you guys to be able to, you know, when you do encounter an unknown plant or, you know, that you can, uh, that you do have the tools to identify it yourself with some, some resources that we, uh, we find. So, um, talking a little bit more about the, uh, the course structure. Um, every lecture, we're going to cover how to ID a series of plants. Um, and we'll show a list of the plants that we're gonna cover up at the top of each lecture so that you have some of that info as we go along. Um, you know, we'll be referring to these throughout the course as plants of the day. Um, so when you hear that or you see a a little plant icon on, on any of the pictures or slides. That means follow along. We're going to walk through the ID process for those important plants. Um, and generally, we're going to try to use those as illustrations for some of the ideas that we're covering um, that day in the lecture as well. So uh, the plants that we're going to cover throughout this course were chosen to be the most relevant to you um, who are interested in either interested in or actively managing prairie strips. So we extracted a list of the top 20 plants found, um, at least in Eastern Iowa CRP that resemble prairie strips, such as uh, CP42 pollinator habitat practices um, and CP25 rare and declining habitat practices. Um, and those were from scientific studies that we did at the Tallgrass Prairie Center, assessing the vegetation in those kinds of stands. So, um, you know, we also tried to make sure that uh, we're going to cover the most common species in the seed mixes as well. So whenever we could, we made sure that uh, we're including species um, that are in some of the more popular prairie seed, prairie strip seed mixes. So with that approach, you know, we'll be covering the most common plants that you're likely to encounter in prairie strips, certainly if you're in Eastern Central Iowa, and also uh, CRP in general. Okay, so today we're going to be covering three plants throughout our uh, lecture here. We're going to be talking about common yarrow, golden Alexander, and wild parsnip. Now, all of these are blooming right now. So, um, kind of one of the ideas behind what we're doing with these plants of the day is we want to make sure that as much as possible. We're talking about plants that you could also go out right after we're done uh, with this lecture and, um, and go out and, and look at it and kind of repeat the, the process that we talk about in the lecture outside on your own uh, with the actual plants. And so 
So that's one thing that we're going to try to do throughout this uh, course is, is hit those plants that are either flowering or have the key characters uh, available for us um, as we talk about them throughout the, the course. Okay, so today we're going to be covering some basics, um, basics of botany, plant ID, and, and we're going to be using that as a foundation for the rest of the course. Um, our first goal is going to be to understand the fundamental concepts and vocabulary uh, that we do use when we identify plants. Um, and through that, we'll talk about some basic plant anatomy, some basic plant ecology, and then talk about how we name plants. Uh, and we're also gonna talk about, um, you know, how can we become familiar with the useful plant tools out there, plant ID tools. Um, we'll talk about some resources available for plant ID. And, and importantly, how to take useful plant photos. Be helpful in our uh, Facebook uh, group, which um, we might want to touch on. Uh, maybe towards the end, Andy, I don't think we went through the Facebook group that much, but uh, I believe that's on the website. Okay, so first things first. Um, so if we're talking about plants, we need to have some kind of a baseline to work. That's the first thing on the agenda. Talk about fundamentals. Um, so there's going to be a lot of jargon. That's kind of this first lecture. There's a lot of, um, you know, really just basic concepts and ideas and structures. So hopefully you can follow along. Um, hopefully we'll pepper that through with some uh, useful examples and things like that to keep you interested. Okay. So this is as basic as it gets. This is a plant, no surprise there. Um, and most all plants you're gonna encounter have this same basic plant. Leaves to photosynthesize and get energy, stems to give them structure, roots to uptake water and nutrients, flowers to reproduce. Sort of a vocabulary thing here. A lot of the time when we talk about a flower, we really are talking about as an inflorescence or a group of flowers. Um, and this will be, more obvious as we talk about how we classify flowers, but just right off the bat, it does matter when we drill down and start talking about things and identifying things like that. So let's talk about each part individually. Okay, leaves. So leaves are very important for plant ID. Um, it's usually, oftentimes, especially this time of the year, it's sometimes all we have to go off of when we identify plants. Um, and so because of that, it is worth breaking the leaf down into a bunch of different parts. So the main part of the leaf is the blade. And that's what we're all used to when we think about a leaf. And we have the midrib, which is the central prominent vein, which pretty much all leaves have. Um, this guy here. Um, and the, uh, there's the leaf margin, which is the edge of the leaf. And the patterns is, are associated with that. Um, the apex or the leaf tip and the base, which is the, uh, the bottom of the leaf, as well as the appendage at the um, base of the leaf called the petiole, which is what connects the leaf to the stem. Just some kind of interesting facts about leaves. They really do take a lot of different shapes and forms. Um, for example, some leaves look almost identical to parts of a flower or bracts. Sometimes they can be really colorful and look really like petals. Um, spines and thorns, those are actually leaves too. Um, so all the thorns on a cactus are actually leaves that are basically just rolled up really, really tight and hardened. So you, you don't think about it, but spines are, are leaves too. Okay, so the leaves are themselves are important, but also important for identification is how the leaves are arranged on the stem. Some leaves go up the stem alternately. Um, you can think about that like the leaves are taking turns coming out, or you can have opposite leaves. Two leaves come out at the same time, opposite each other. Um, or there's another situation, sort of a free for all, where you have more than two leaves coming out in the same place on the stem, which is what we call world leaf arrangement. Uh, this one is relatively uncommon. So when we see it on a plant, it's actually a good thing that we can uh, 
kind of have fewer potential species um, to think about when we're trying to identify. Um, another way to describe leaf arrangement is where the leaves are born on the stem. So if the leaves are all coming from the base of the plant, we call those basin leaves. Um, and oftentimes we'll refer to a collection of basal leaves as a rosette. Um, for leaves that rise uh, from the stem part of the plant, uh, those we call colleen leaves or uh, nucum skies will be calling them stem leaves. So I'm gonna try to use the plain English uh, language terms as much as I can, but there are some, some terms that just kind of have to be the technical term. So we will try to use the term stem leaves instead of calling leaves, for example. Um, okay, so we're thinking about leaf type. Um, this is sort of, sort of a combination of the, uh, the leaf margins and also um, kind of how the leaf is, uh, is laid out in its plan. So um, First uh, leaf type that's important is, uh, is our entire leaves. So these are leaves with a smooth, unbroken margin. Um, toothed leaves, we also have, those are quite common. And, and those have regular shallow indentations on the margin. As you get sort of more, uh, you know, as the indentations become less shallow, uh, deeper, uh, they become what we call lobed. Leaves become lobe, lobed at a certain point. And then uh, once the, the leaves uh, actually kind of get lobed or dissected or um, indented all the way to the leaf midrib, um, then we start calling them divided. So this is where we have the leaf in separate parts. And we'll talk a little bit more about that because it can be pretty important in differentiating different plants. Okay, so divided leaves. So again, these are plants, or these, these are leaves that have um, separate leaf parts. So we, we talk about um, palmate leaves, which are uh, divided leaves, which are terminal leaflets. Uh, pinnate, once pinnate or once dissected. And this is when we have it, leaflets arranged on either side of the leaf stalk. So this is a pretty good time to talk about what is a leaf stalk, what is a stem, because it can be pretty confusing if you're you know, taking a look at it for the first time. Um, so here's an example uh, at the top here. So when we see a dissected or a divided leaf in the wild, what we want to find is the plant stem. So um, and then we'll find a leaf that is connected to the stem. And then we'll find all of these different leaflets. So here are our leaflets. And uh, here's our leaf stem or our leaf stalk, and our plant stem, which is the, the main part of the plant. Um, as you start observing this stuff in nature, you'll notice that um, sometimes the things that you thought were leaves are actually leaflets. So, you know, kind of, kind of slowing down, thinking about, okay, how does this, how does this attach to the stem? And then especially how are the leaflets attached to the, the, the structures within? So this is when we're talking about pinnate. So pinnate leaves are um, arranged and leaflets are arranged on either side of the leaf stalk. And then you can have uh, twice pinnate or twice divided leaves, which are when they're leaflets are coming off of a, of a branched leaf stem. So we'll, uh, we'll see some examples of those. If that's not uh, totally clear, we're going to talk a little bit about that with some real world examples. Um, continuing on to talk about leaves, um, you know, there's a variety of leaf shapes. So uh, specifically, we're going to cover the ones that are important to Newcomb's um, guide. There is just tons of different Latin description words of, of leaf shapes that we are not going to cover. Um, there are a lot of different leaf shapes you would encounter in the world. So there's a word for just about 
but we're going to focus on these. These six are pretty important, pretty diagnostic. Um, so, you know, narrow leaf shape, uh, long, thin leaves, um, oblong leaves. Those are leaves that are longer than they are wide, they have parallel sides, they kind of look like a tic tac or something like that, or pill. Um, elliptical leaves, which are generally two to three times longer than they are wide. And you have lance shaped leaves, which have broad base that taper to a point, egg shaped leaves that look like eggs, and uh, heart shaped leaves that are they're, they're shaped like a heart. Those are pretty, pretty easy to remember. Okay. So now that we've covered leaves, um, let's apply that information to a plant ID scenario. So uh, we'll be doing some plants of the day now. Okay, so what are we looking at? This is, this is a hedgerow, edge of field habitat that uh, you might encounter uh, when you're dealing with a strip, uh, especially if a strip is on the edge of a field. Um, this is uh, got all kinds of different plants in here. Where do we even start? It just looks like a massive biomass. Okay, so one way to approach this, if we're curious about what, what's growing here, is to start and say, okay, what's blooming? It's always a good approach to having some success, especially when we're uh, starting to uh, identify plants um, you know, at this point. Okay, so what is blooming here? Well, it's like really there's only these yellow flowers. So, um, they look pretty similar. So maybe we're actually looking at one kind of plant. Um, of course, the only way to know is to take a closer look. Um, and we do that, and we're going to have to compare the two to see if they are the same. OK. So here's one of those flowering plants that we want to, uh, to look at, maybe collect. Um, now we're going to wait until next lecture to do a full ID approach. Um, and right now, we're just going to focus on the leaves. So what do the leaves look like on this plant? Um, one thing we know is there's a lot to learn from the leaves, especially uh, towards the base of the plant. So those are the oldest leaves and the most uh, well-developed. So we're going to take a look at that. OK, so uh, now we're looking at the base of the plant. What, what in the world is going on here? Right? There are leaves of all shapes and sizes various leaves that look, I mean, they're right next to the stem, which what's even, where do you even go from here? So what we just have to do is we have to get even closer to the ground and see which, which of these leaves are actually emerging right next to the stem. And as we get down to the base, we can start kind of moving some of this vegetation to the side of the stem. And what we end up finding out is that actually there are these leaves only that are coming out right from the stem. So now that we've identified these leaves, these basal leaves, um, we can look at the, the whole plant. Okay, so here's the whole plant. So at this point, you know, we should cover some of the things that we've uh, review some of the things that we covered. So how are the leaves attached on this particular plant? Okay. We see that only one leaf emerges at a node, so that means it's altered. So um, we also find in this plant, once we've taken a good look at it, uh, that it has basal and stem leaves. So uh, next thing we want to do, take a closer look at that leaf. And again, we want to look at the basal leaves or the oldest leaves or the leaves that are farthest down the stem to get the best leaf characteristics, because those are the oldest leaves, the most um, time to develop. OK, so here is a single leaf. And remember, we want to find a single leaf. So um, how do we do that? We go up the stem and find out where the first place that a leaf type part is coming out of the stem. And that's where our leaf starts. So as you can see, this would have been where the leaf attached to the stem of the plant. Now, because this is a, uh, I'll just give this away. This is a divided leaf, right? So um, that means it's going to be broken up into multiple parts, 
So that's probably one of the most important characteristics here in this plant is that it's divided and it's also divided two times. By that, I mean, we start from the central leaf stalk right here. You could think of it, uh, the leaflets are not coming off in pairs from the central stalk, but actually from a secondary stalk. This secondary stalk is where the leaves come off of. And you can think of it like leaflets are living on a side street off the main road in these twice divided leaves, whereas uh, leaflets live right on you know, once divided or once painted leaves. Okay, other things to think about um, that we know uh, we can review based on uh, what we're seeing here is that we know these uh, leaflets, they have an egg shaped egg-shaped leaflet, and the margins are finely toothed. So these uh, very clear teeth uh, as we go up the margin. Okay, so what is this plant? This is Golden Alexanders, or Zizia aurea. Um, doesn't, most of the time we're talking about the same uh, species of Golden Alexanders, um, also known as Golden Zizia in some texts. Pretty short plant. Um, it's not rhizominous. It has got fibrous roots, even though it often will show up in kind of large clumps uh, of land. And it's, it's pretty much at the end of its uh, bloom period right now. So you're mostly only going to find um, developing fruits or seed heads at this point, but there are a couple flowers still out there. Um, of interest on this one, why this is important more specifically is that it is by far the most commonly seeded and often it's the only observed spring wildflower in CRP plantings, including prairie strips. It has very reliable establishment. Pretty much uh, whenever you plant it, it's coming up as well. So this is definitely, especially if you're going through prairie strips this time of year, this is going to be your uh, probably one of your only forbs that's blooming. Okay, so at this point, um, I think it's a good time to take a break. Um, so we'll take these breaks. We'll, we have a couple of these throughout each lecture. Um, so these will be a good chance for you to ask any questions, get clarification. Um, so you can put your questions in the chat. And, and that, that goes to throughout the course, if you have questions, the best place to, to put those will be in the chat and then we can address them um, in these, uh, these Q&A body break sessions. So we'll take about five minutes if we have questions and uh, talk through some of those. So Andy, do we have any questions in the chat? Not seeing any right now. Um, Okay, well, if there are no questions, uh, I'll give uh, folks a couple more minutes to, uh, to chime in, but um, if we don't get any more questions, we'll, we'll go ahead and keep moving. Um, just, uh, this is a prairie strip here. Uh, I'll try to add in as much prairie strip uh, adjacent material as we can during the course. This is a really nice prairie strip that uh, is in Blackhawk County. Um, and as you can see, very poor bridge. Um, and this one was planted in the fall, which I think uh, was a very strong um, determinant of uh, the, uh, the poor richness of that uh, strip. So um, I think we'll probably talk a little bit more about that as we get into in each of the individual species. A lot of them have kind of their own tips and tricks to getting established. Um, but uh, in general, fall, fall seeding is a good approach to, uh, to uh, getting prairie strips started. And um, uh, how do we do in the chat? Any questions? We got, got a, a couple. Yep, got a couple. So one is, uh, will we be providing copy of the slides? Yes, we will. We probably uh, putting those on our website at some point. Um, Kirsten asks, is Golden Alexander native? Uh, even I know that one. Uh, yes, it is. 
Um, and then here's a good Justin, uh, Justin question. Why is Golden Alexander the only or most common spring wildflower in CRP mixes? Why aren't more typically included? Yeah, let me clarify that um, a little bit. But um, so it's, it's the only one that you typically, sometimes it's the only one you typically find in the established vegetation. Almost all of these programs, uh, CRP practices have requirements for having three spring blooming species at least. Um, and Zizia is almost always one of those three. Um, but the question of why are they um, so common compared to the other ones that are seeded sometimes, but they maybe don't come up. Some of the reason is costs. Uh, Golden Alexander's cheap, uh, easy to produce, um, and it's reliable. Uh, some of our other spring things, you know, especially things like prairie flocks, very expensive, and they are they're kind of tough to get going from seed. So, uh, especially at the price point that I think most people would uh, be willing to tolerate, yeah, prairie flocks. While it, it would be a good prairie strip addition, um, it just has basically because it has explosive seed dispersal. Um, you know, the, the seed pods literally burst and shoot seeds everywhere. And if you're a seed producer, that means you've got a real challenge ahead of you because you can't, you know, seed shatter is complete. It doesn't, it doesn't occur gradually over time or, or not a good, necessarily a good time to uh, harvest that stuff. So, so, you know, there's a lot of challenges associated with producing the early season stuff and that's what contributes to cost and that's ultimately why there's fewer uh, spring species coming uh, up and in the new seed mix of it, I think. Okay, let's see, how are we doing on time? Um, I think we will have, I think we have time for one more. Yeah, and this goes sort of with your previous answer, but uh, Alice asks, what value does Golden Alexander add to prairie strips? Yeah, the value is the spring pollinator value. So that means, so we're talking about it's the only one coming up in the spring. Well, that means that this is, it is a very key player in providing pollinator habitat for a variety of species. Um, so native bees, uh, all kinds of different pollinators are using Golden Alexander in the prairie strips. Um, I'm pretty sure there's some literature on that, but uh, especially coming out of Minnesota, uh, but I couldn't give you those. Uh, maybe we can post some of those links later in the course uh, uh, to supplement that. But uh, yeah, it's it, value is pollinator value. And most of the Forbes as one of their large uh, contributions is providing pollinator habitat. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yes, and uh, it, it, yeah, host plant for, uh, yeah, so when we talk about pollinator habitat, that includes forage and uh, host plant availability as well. So swallow, swallowtails uh, like those uh, use uh, plants in the care family. So, okay, so I think it's a probably a good time to keep moving. So, um, so let's move on to our second plant. This is going to be kind of a companion to the first. Okay, so what about that other yellow flower plant in the stand? Um, so again, we'll take a closer look. Um, and as we take a closer look, we see something a little different than the Golden Alexander. We see potentially a different species. So now when we take it out of, uh, of that stand, we, we see we still have alternate leaf attachment, um, but we see something new here in the scope fleshy taproot. So we know Golden Alexander does not have that. So we're definitely looking at different species. And here's a single leaf. How is this different than the Golden Alexander leaf that we looked at? The difference is the leaf division. So this one is uh, pinnately divided once or once divided, um, where Golden Alexander, remember, was two to three times divided. So here we have the leaflets coming 
right off the central stock. Um, and so that is our pinnate or once divided leaf. But with most of the other uh, characteristics, it's very similar to golden Alexander. Egg-shaped leaflets, tooth margins, really that uh, the how many times divided is, is giving us a big clue uh, in terms of uh, how to differentiate this plant from golden Alexander. Okay, what is this plant? This is wild parsnip. Uh, probably all heard about wild parsnip. It is a phototoxic, has phototoxic uh, sap. So if you damage the uh, plants and you get the uh, exudes on you uh, and you're in the sun, you can get uh, pretty, pretty nasty burns, chemical burns. So it's very important that you're able to identify this species opposed to Golden Alexander. Definitely will, uh, uh, especially if you're wearing shorts, I would recommend wearing shorts when you're doing plant ID, but going out in the field doesn't make sense. But if you are, you definitely need to know the difference between the two. Because a uh, field of Golden Alexander will not give you any problems, whereas walking through a field of wild parsnip very well may prep, <laughs> prove uh, very problematic for you down the road. So. This is not native. This is an introduced species, uh, pretty invasive. It will, um, it will invade remnant prairies, prairie strips, um, and uh, it's a biennial. So, you know, uh, we could talk about how that, you know, impacts some of our decision making uh, down the road. But uh, for now, we're going to just focus on the fact that this is parsnip. This is it's starting its sort of peak bloom right about now. And it really does look very similar to Golden Alexander. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, how, those, uh, how those can uh, be differentiated. Um, so again, so this is directly looking at the two plants. So this hopefully will give us really good uh, utility in telling them apart. So again, the key uh, to figuring out the difference between Golden Alexander and wild parsnip is the number, is the leaf division. So once divided in wild parsnip, kind of looks like a ladder uh, with those leaflets going up the stem, whereas Golden Alexander has these two to three times divided leaflets. Another thing that you can use to ID um, the two species is how um, the kinds of ridges on the stems. So both of the species have ridges on the stems. But in parsnip, you can visually see them. They're very obvious. They're very large ridges up along the stem. Whereas in, in Golden Alexander, they're typically very small. And you can only feel them with your finger and not really see them. OK, so next, let's take a look at uh, the stems. So um, stems usually don't have a lot of variation. They're parts uh, that we can use to uh, differentiate plants. But we do need to know some basic vocabulary associated with them. Um, the node is where the leaves emerge, and the space from one node to the next is called the internode. Looking at roots, um, so there's a technical plant physiological meaning for roots, um, which defines them as the structures for just uptaking water and nutrients. Um, but I think it's easier to think about them um, as basically anything underneath the ground. So uh, when we define them that way, kind of depart from the technical accuracy of it, um, the roots can have a lot to tell us about what uh, different species are. So first kind of root is a tap root, which is most familiar, I think, of, of the roots. So uh, this one is a true root. Um, it's got that main thick root with uh, sem uh, smaller secondary roots coming off of it. And that's what a lot of biennials and perennials have. Dandelion, burdock, parsnip. Um, parsnip is actually also edible. You can eat taproot. Um, that's parsnip is, is the wild variety of the garden cultivated one. I've had them before. They're OK. <laughs> um, other uh, kinds of roots, uh, the fibrous root system, um, that's really common in prairie plants. 
basically it's a big mass of fine roots and you can see a good example of that of these with our prairie roots project the tallgrass prairie center um, you can visit the website and look through some pictures there of, of prairie root systems that have these fine roots um, most of our grasses have this um, some variation of fibrous roots and most annual plants do as well Okay, and then we have the roots that are not actually roots, but uh, are very useful for ID purposes. Uh, the first one uh, is a bulb, which is an uh, underground storage organ primarily. They have layers. Um, of course, onions are the, the classic example of, of bulbs, but also lilies, other species do have those as well. Um, similar to that is a corm. Uh, looks very similar to a bulb, but uh, unlike the bulb, which has layers, corm is just a kind of a starchy uh, appendage. So, and these are uh, important in things like blazing, pre blazing stars. And corms. Um, next is the rhizome, which is basically an underground stem, and they run below the soil um, and often will shoot out in many directions. Um, with new above ground plants coming up from spots along it. And these are very powerful means of vegetation, vegetative reproduction. And tons of grasses have these, as well as a lot of forbs. So when we talk about clonal growth or colony forming plants or colonial, um, we generally are referring to a rhizomatous species. And then the last is a stolen is similar to a rhizome, except it runs above ground and not uh, below ground. So uh, one plant you probably already know, which has stones, are, are strawberries. Okay, so let's talk about flowers, or specifically some of the flower groupings or inflorescences that we're likely to encounter. So here's some of the most common inflorescence types. Again, the clusters that we're going to see. Basic ones are is the racine, which you can kind of think of like we talk, uh, talked about stems and leaves, um, but instead of leaves, we're talking about flowers. So here we have the red dots of the real flowers, and they're arranged on a variety of stems. So, um, so racine is the basic uh, kind of uh, inflorescence, um, but we can have divided or compound. Or seams, and those are called panicles. Um, you have uh, racemes that lose their pedicels or their leaf stalks, so to speak, and those become spikes where the flowers are right on the actual stem. And there's some specialized inflorescences that are uh, useful for identifying plant families. So the head, just sort of uh, where all the flowers are really closely clustered together, kind of like on a plate, um, that's a classic example of the sunflower family. Um, and then umbels, which is where um, flowers all come from the same point, usually flat on top. And that is a very good indicator of carrot family. And uh, both wild parsnip and golden alexander are good examples of that. OK, so talking about flower symmetry, um, so this is kind of how we can uh, divide flower types. Up. So this is how Newcomb's Guide walks us through identifying, using flowers for identification. So uh, the first uh, kind of flower symmetry and flower type is regular. And this is where the petal-like parts are arranged around the center point. So I'm gonna keep talking about petal-like parts because when we get too technical, we find that there's tons of things that we see that are not actually petals, and it really doesn't matter for the, the approach that we're taking with this course. So, so we'll keep talking about petal-like parts. Uh, we also have irregular flowers, which are um, when we have petal-like parts that are arranged, um, they're not arranged around a central point. Um, often they are you know, symmetrical. You know, if you put a line through it, they would be symmetrical from uh, both sides, but they are not you know, symmetrical from the central point. Um, and then the other uh, 
type of flower, indistinguishable petals. And these are basically flowers where they're, they're just so small, the petal-like parts are too small to see, or they've been modified so that they don't look anything like a petal. Okay, so let's do a little practice with that. So, so where do we begin with this? So, you know, is, 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 so this is what you'd, you'd see when you come up to this plant. Um, you know, are we talking about central uh, radial symmetry? Is this the center of the flower? Does it go kind of like this? Well, the first place to start is ask where are the, where's the flower? Where are the petal like parts? So these are not petal like parts. We have to get closer. Okay, so here's the actual flower, and now we can see some petal like parts. Um, in this particular example, we have five regular parts. And um, in this, this is a butterfly milkweed. And milkweeds, uh, like we're talking about, actual petals are farther down. And uh, often the things that you see are, are sort of specialized uh, floral structures that, again, petal like parts, and they have the same symmetry. OK, so let's talk more about the actual flower flowers. Um, now that we've kind of gone through the difference between inflorescence and, and flower. Um, so, you know, we're not going to cover this in too much detail, um, but the, the key is that, you know, there's some of the things that, uh, you know, often you have two sexual parts um, or groups parts, the pistil and the stamen, um, both are potentially useful in identifying uh, different plants. Um, some of the things that will be more obvious to us when we're identifying things are the petals or the group of petals, the corolla, and the sepals, which are below the petals, or a collection of those with the calyx. Those are typically easier to spot. The other sexual parts are usually things that you need a hand lens to see. Okay, so now that we know the fundamentals of, of Plants, uh, some of these body uh, or these uh, plant anatomy fundamentals. Um, uh, I think it's a good place to uh, kind of talk about some more ecological things. So, you know, we covered plants at the individual level, and of course, most of plant identification is based on characters of individual plants. Um, but we can get some really helpful clues from thinking about the context of the plant and the landscape. So we think about the sort of hierarchy of ecological classifications. Um, the next step up from individual is population. Uh, most of the time, this is a group of individual plants in a specific spatial area, usually determined by how far seeds can travel. Uh, populations can be a big help in figuring out an implant, or at least in making a good guess as to what a plant probably is, even if normal characters that we usually rely on are missing. And basically, in a nutshell, if you're trying to identify a plant, you see a lot of other individuals and plant species around you, it's reasonably likely that you're also looking at that same species. Um, or if not, you know, the first thing you need to do would be to compare it against the dominant plant. This is really useful when you uh, find a good plant population. You can look at that species with a lot more confidence in terms of identifying seedlings, young plants, vegetative plants, that kind of thing. And also the way the population is laid out can help you identify a species sometimes. So for example, um, this photo here is a big population all clustered together. Again, that's probably telling us the plant's clonal, it's rhizominous. Uh, and so that'll help us identify it as Perdicoriopsis. Um, the next step up, zooming out, is the plant community. Um, we won't talk about too much of that with respect to CRP and gray strips because the seed mix is such a big part of that. Um, but same same goes with ecoregion. Um, you know, we could think about zooming out even farther, uh, thinking about plants at the ecoregional level. Um, Ecoregions are areas of similar climate, topography, soil types. So, um, you know, 
really it comes down to climate. The soils are so influenced by that. But you know, as an example, you know, we are in the Western Corn Belt Plains ecoregion. And just from knowing that, we know that there's some species we'll find more often than not. Uh, we're not at all, let's say, you know, something in the Acadian Plains of Eastern Maine. So East, the Lico region gives us a sort of big list of potential possibilities. Um, so, but again, I'll add that what we're when we're talking about prey strips, and any native plantings, the eco region and community they give us fewer clues than say the seed mix. We'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. Okay, so let's talk about plant names. So. Most plants uh, have both a common name and a scientific name. All plants have a scientific name. Um, in this course, we're going to try to use them both whenever we can. Now, common names are typically the first ones that people learn, but we do have to be careful because there's a lot of possibility for confusion with common names. So um, be aware that there, there is no official or agreed upon common name. This can be really frustrating for people, especially if you come from a wildlife background. Sometimes there are official common names. Um, as we'll see in an example, uh, we'll talk about here in a second. Um, looking up a plant with a common name can uh, cause you some headaches. So, and it can also cause you problems of putting together a seed mix or using a seed mix as a tool, um, especially for some species. Okay, so on the other hand, we have scientific names. These are standardized, they're based on Latin and Greek usually. Um, they always take the form of genus as the first word and species as the second word. Um, while it can be a bigger challenge to learn the scientific names, it will pay off. And you can almost always successfully look up references using scientific names. But having said that, there are these are scientific names that are based on science. And as we learn more about the relationships of plants, the science can change sometimes. The scientific name will too. So uh, try to use up-to-date sources, uh, most authoritative sources like War North America uh, when you're learning scientific names. Um, and uh, throughout this course, we're gonna try to use the quote unquote most authoritative scientific names. So for North America, Integrated Taxonomic um, System, ITIS. Um, so, okay, so let's go back to uh, common names and what we might want to watch out for. Okay, so here's an example of white sage versus white sage. One white sage is in the aster family. It's common in Iowa. It's important tall grass prey species that you're likely to find in prey strips. Other one is a mint that's only found in coastal sage scrub on the Southern California coast. They're really different plants, but California white sage is the one that comes up when you Google it. So how do we avoid that confusion? Well, you could learn the other common names of white sage, uh, Louisiana sage wart, white sagebrush, silver wormwood, but those are not necessarily any more uh, useful not very many sources that use one or the other. But if you learn the scientific name, you'll always know that you get relevant search results or the correct seeds in your seed mix or that you're looking for the right plant. Okay, so I'm going to uh, have a, a break here. We're kind of running up against time. So I might uh, keep our break, uh, push that off until the end of the end of the Sure. So, yeah, let's let's keep moving. Um, so now we're going to kind of uh, move into an, another section about the tools of the trade. So the kinds of things that we want to be aware of when we're talking about uh, identifying plants. Okay, so we have five senses, and we can use just about all of them to, uh, to help us identify plants. Of course, sight is obvious. Uh, we're not going to don't need to say much more about that. Most of all, plant ID is based on that. But smell, smell is probably my favorite one. Since plants are always surprising me by the way they smell. There's a wide variety of smells out there. Uh, citrus, minty, garlicky. Um, 
there's a smell someone once uh, described as spaghetti sprinkled with mint. That one grows more commonly in Minnesota, but uh, probably won't see that one gray strips. But you know, you get a sense of wide range of smells and how that can, can help us uh, ID stuff. Um, taste, a lot of different tastes are often related to the smells. Sometimes they can be very surprising, like uh, this here sorrel. Um, doesn't look like much or smell like much, but it's very sour and sweet. Um, Pask flower, that is a very interesting one. It's very spicy. Um, now I do have to put a disclaimer in here that uh, you don't want to be using, you don't want to just be eating any plant that you don't know what it is. Um, there are definitely poisonous plants out there like carrot, species in the carrot family, absolutely fair. Um, not something you want to be eating without knowing exactly what it is. Um, things like poison hemlock, um, water hemlock, very poisonous things, deadly poisonous things that you do not want to eat. Um, and the last one is touch. Again, very helpful. Whether the leaves are smooth, hairy, sandpapery, those are all really good clues to what plant is. Okay, so um, as we talk about using scent as an ID tool, uh, here's a good plant. Here's our last plant of the day. Um, this is common yarrow, uh, Killia millifolium. Um, and this one has a really unique scent. I, I guess I would describe it as potpourri. Um, it's a very, um, very unique plant. It has these feathery, many times divided leaves. Um, and that uh, is a good characteristic. There's not too many other plants that have that uh, feathery look to them. Um, it's in the aster family. It has that, that collection of flowers called the head. Um, and, and this is one that's uh, pretty common in a lot of seed mixes, especially lower cost ones. It's extremely easy to produce and it's easy to establish. Um, at the same time, it's also kind of out on the landscape. Uh, every once in a while, you'll find this just coming up in a regular field, um, in a fallow field, it'll just show up. So, you know, whether it needs to be in a seed mix is kind of an open question, but uh, it's, a, it's a useful plant. It's a, again, it's a, pollinators like this plant too. Um, and again, it's easy to establish. So. You'll you definitely likely you you are likely to encounter this plant in, in gray strips eventually. So uh, whether that's because it was planted or it just showed up on its, on its own, um, this is an important plant to know. A um, little bit about the plant as well is it's quite short. Um, so now now is the good time to go find it because it'll be kind of uh, overgrown once uh, we hit July. Um, uh, it's also rhizomatous, so you can, especially when there's uh, high seeding rates, you can see this be kind of a dominant plant in some, some areas. Okay, so uh, moving on to some other um, plant ID tools. Um, some helpful tools to have at your disposal are your hand lenses, um, especially trying to see small details. Um, you're going to need a hand lens. So if you do go buy a hand lens, you don't really need magnification over 10, 10x. Um, 7 to 10x is a good place to go with it. If you go higher than 10, you'll have a harder time seeing the larger structures. So 10x is a good place to start. OK, so talking about cameras and photograph photography for botany, um, you know, I love taking pictures, I love photography. Um, I have a, a camera, a dedicated camera that I take out to do plant photography every once in a while and I get really good photos and that are, you know, easy, high quality stuff to, uh, to uh, use characteristics from. But that's typically not something that most people are going to carry around. So, um, uh, you know, taking pictures is a important. Um, and the most important thing is a picture that's taken. So they're really important for record keeping. Um, but using your, your camera on your phone is almost always going to be the way to go. Um, 
you always have it with you. Um, and most cameras nowadays and, and smartphones are extremely good quality. So this example is from 2016 and that has plenty of detail needed to do all kinds of identification. So, so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how to take a good picture uh, for plant ID. So one of the key ideas for taking a good photo for plant identification purposes is to take a lot of them. Um, but more specifically, you know, the key parts of the plant. And that includes the habitat or the population, the entire plants, leaves and stem, and the flowers. So here's an example of this plant here, this uh, little white flower. Um, so we took a picture of the kind of the habitat population level. We can see that it looks clonal, um, maybe clonal. Um, it's sort of in this uh, hedgerow habitat. So that's going to help us identify things. Um, taking a look at the whole plant, this shows us some additional information. There's a world leaf emergence here. Take a look at the leaves, a leaf photo and a flower photo. Here we can see palmate leaves. Um, and we can also uh, palmate leaf dissected leaves and a flower with um, five times uh, five radial, uh, five flower parts. All right, so um, another thing to consider, certainly today is a good example of that. Um, taking pictures in the morning can help you quite a bit. Um, so there are some plants that as it gets hot or sunny, they will close their flowers or roll their leaves. Um, and you will have a much harder time identifying them midday and afternoon than you would in the morning. So here's a good example here, a spider wart on the left. That's at 4 p.m. Flowers are all closed up. 7 a.m. on the other side, flowers are all open. You get all kinds of easy to uh, key out characters, like three, uh, three flower parts, uh, flower color. All those kinds of things are much more helpful than you know, we were basically doing vegetative identification in the other one. Okay, the other thing, make sure you focus on the plant. So um, whether that means using macro mode or spot focus, whether whatever your camera, uh, camera or your phone does, uh, make sure you figure out how to, how to focus close and uh, double check your photographs after you take them to make sure that you don't have something like this, which is not super helpful. All right, so um, moving on to our last uh, plant identification tool, but it is a very important one, um, and that is the seed mix. So when we keep seed mix records for planting, um, we're actually keeping a document that's going to be really helpful for identifying what's growing in there. So um, you know you can kind of think of a seed mix as a blueprint for vegetation, especially when we're talking about plantings into corn and bean fields. Um, you know, what we plant ideally is what we should expect to find growing. Um, of course, if you've done prairie restoration, um, done, you know, native plantings, you know that's not always the case, but it's still a pretty reliable principle. Um, in that way, the mix acts in some ways like a plant list that shows us what plants to look for. Uh, and that narrows down the possibilities a lot. So, for example, Newcomb's guide has over a thousand different plants. In it. And if we can combine that with the seed mix, it'll narrow down the possibilities down to 30 or 40. And so, um, of course, that doesn't account for the weeds, but it's still very helpful. Um, the other thing seed mixes can help with is that we can use them to set expectations for how commonly we should find plants in the mix. Um, you know, we can look at seeding rates to know how much of each species was planted. And based on that, we can expect plants with high seeding rates to be more common than those with low seeding rates. Um, now, that's not always the case since uh, plant establishment varies a lot, species by species, um, but generally the principle can be helpful. Um, so, here's an example, which is a real CRP seed mix planted in uh, 2015. Um, and we see the list of species planted. 
the uh, both the scientific name and the common name, thankfully. Um, uh, we see the rate at, the, at which each species was planted. Uh, so most of the time, the column is going to be pounds per acre, PLS per acre, seeds per square foot. Um, and those are all ways to express the seeding rate. So here we have our seeding rate um, in pounds per acre. And we see that this is sorted already by seeding rate. So we should expect, for example, site oats gramma and uh, Virginia wild rye to be pretty common if we're looking at uh, this in, as it's establishing. Um, and then prairie mimosa, partridge pea, those should also be pretty common too. Um, and then here's another example of a seed mix, which is more difficult to read. Uh, but again, look for the different seeding rate measures. Here it's expressed in percent. Okay, that is all I have for today. We're uh, at 106. So um, if you're still with us, um, just want to remind everybody uh, that this is being recorded. So um, We'll have it up hopefully pretty soon for you to revisit um, if you um, have to go uh, or have to, to duck out early. Um, but also want to uh, put in a plug for the uh, Facebook page. Um, I believe you can get more info on that at the uh, Botany Fingers website that we have at tallgrassprecenter.org. Um, and, and, uh, and so, yeah, so with that, I'll uh, open it up to questions to, uh, to round it out. And um, thank you for uh, sticking with us and um, hope to see you again next week. Andy, do we have any questions? Yeah, there was one that came up about the white flower plant with palmate leaves um, a few slides ago. Uh -huh. The Canada um, anemone. Yep, this is Canada anemone. So um, not one on our plant list, but it, it is a very common, useful plant to know, um, especially if you're dealing with wetlands. So typically something you find more in a wet, wet area. Any other questions? I've just seen a lot of thank yous in chat, uh, which is good. Um, a question from earlier was how narrow can a prairie strip be? Uh, I threw that in the chat. It's 30 feet if we're talking the CRP specific practice for prairie strips. So. Yeah, and even even if you're not in, even if you're just doing it um, on your own, um, you probably want to keep it that um, as a minimum. As you farm around it, often you'll chip away at it. It doesn't take much to, especially if you've got the, uh, if your tillage, your tillage is off a little bit, you really will, you will lose the prairie where that happens. So, you know, having a buffer, making it bigger than you wanted it to be, will over time mean it stays at a healthy level. Same with spray drift as well. So bigger is always better with prairie strips. So, but you know, anything's better than nothing at the same time. So. Another question for Matthew. Will there be discussion of the benefits of reduction in nutrients by prairie strips? Um, yeah, so their prairie strips are a huge benefit to nutrient reduction. There's been quite a bit of work from the Iowa State Strips team that's looked at that. Um, and, oh, if I could come up with these numbers off the top of my head, don't quote me on this. Um, actually, um, so if you take 10% of the field, um, put, ten, uh, put, those, put that 10% into prairie strips, um, you, you, you're those uh, reduce, the studies show that you re can reduce uh, nitrogen loss from that field um, by, I think it's up to or around 80% compared to without prairie strips. Um, that one 
you're best you're better off just to look at <laughs> Iowa Strips website to get that for sure. But we can also put a, a link to that in the in some of our other materials as we go on in the course. Um, another question, if you want a prairie strip to visually separate a house from stock tank, stock, stock tank and concrete pad, what would be the minimum uh, effective width? I think that's a maybe a hard question to answer without seeing a map or seeing the site. Um, yeah, that would be, that's one of those questions that are probably best answered by, um, someone you're working with directly on your farm so um, we'll, we'll we'll sort of be dealing with generalities here i think um, so mostly um, so i don't think we could uh, answer that one. all right i think we should probably wrap it up thanks again justin like like you mentioned, there will be recording of this and that sort of thing. So thanks, everybody, especially everyone who stuck around. So uh, we're going to go ahead and end it. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.